We're here at the Milken Institute Conference uh, on Tuesday, having a great time and a long day of pretty exciting activity. But really, I uh, feel privileged and pleasured by the opportunity to sit with Andrew Bednar, CEO of Prella Weinberg. Andrew, thanks for coming. Thank you. How's the uh, conference going so far for you? You know, the conference has been great. It is our first time as a firm and also my first time here and there has been just an incredible amount of talent and information flow. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, a lot of overflow of information, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it is a you know, rapid fire learning on a pretty broad range of topics around finance, but also government, and uh, a lot of initiatives around the world that people are really focused on. I think for, for me, what was really the eye-opener and, and the takeaway, which I did not expect, is that for many of us, we're so focused day to day on minutia and details yeah. in our markets, in our firm, with our daily lives. And you come here and you have a moment to fly at such an altitude where you could have a different vantage point and understand that people are doing some amazing work. Uh, there's going to be such uh, dramatic change coming that uh, the rate of change is so high. I would say the two things that really permeate the entire conference are AI for sure, and they're just private credit and really the available dry powder in that particular market. And I, and I think with AI, for example, I, I come away believing three things strongly. One, people are going to make a lot of money in AI. Sure. Two, people are going to lose a lot of money in AI. Yep. And three, it's going to change my life in some way. And the only one I know for sure is going to happen is three. I'm not <laughs> sure about whether I'll be in one or two. But uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic about that, but also quite sober in thinking about the impact of AI and the transition that society, that kids coming out of college, so many different people are going to face you know, pretty significant on, disruption. On business, on yeah. society. For sure. Um, well, I, so that was uh, a long answer, but it was on my mind as a key feature of the conference. And Milken does that to everyone. It's yep. a flood of ideas, right? That's right. Um, well, we had the pleasure to uh, spend some time and listen to your panel. So while I have you, talk if you could about the state of the M&A environment in general. Um, we're sitting here with, seems to be a little bit of optimism coming out of this with some volume starting to peak up. And, and you in particular and your firm have had some pretty good unique success. Yeah, thank you. We, uh, we are seeing a pickup, particularly in larger transactions. I think that's a function of clients really having a scale problem where they've seen their values go up quite significantly through the last uh, cycle. Equity values are at, you know, near historic highs. And as you get larger, it's more and more challenging to drive return on equity for your investors. And there's only so much you're going to get out of revenue and revenue growth in this stage of the economic cycle. Uh, there's a little bit more work people can do in the middle of the P&L. They can uh, increase dividends a bit and they can do more buybacks. Beyond that, they have to think about building something or buying something. And for most companies outside of technology, there's not a lot of analysis on build versus buy. You just don't have the time and by the time you build it, technology's already moved so much further and transformation happens very fast. And so. We do have a lot of clients looking at buying, and they are of a larger scale because they want something that moves the needle. What about the environment uh, and the headwinds? So we have political uncertainty. We have a high cost of capital. Is that hindering and people are still waiting for the opportune time in 2024, or do we think it's now as good a time as any? You know, I said it earlier on the panel that you referenced uh, that the m and markets are conviction markets. Unlike buying stocks and bonds or selling stocks and bonds, which are prediction markets. Right. I'm making uh, a judgment about whether they're going to go up or down in price. In the M&A markets, yeah. you have to have a lot of conviction. And it's, it's analytical conviction, and it's also emotional conviction. I think on the analytics, it's quite compelling for many companies to actually transact. Mm -hmm. But I would say the issues that are out there You've mentioned, you know, geopolitical, two wars. You have, you know, suggestions one week that rates are coming down this year. Another one saying rates might go up. Maybe there's a cut in September. How about December? You, you watch the news. You pick up a paper. 
There's things you don't understand. They're confusing. There's a lot of disillusionment. And I, I think there's an emotional element to conviction that we see inside the boardroom with executives and board members that they're just not quite getting over that yet. And so it's really not financial inhibitions. It's something more emotional at this stage. And it's, uh, it's a unique perspective you speak of, simply, again, not just financial. But talk, if you could, about your firm. Um, you have come from a large bank background, and you were a founding partner, and you rely on the advice of your partners and that what they give to your, uh, to your special set of clients. How is that unique? How is that trending? Your capital providers and the company capital providers, they're changing. Is this a secular trend that's coming your way, or is there still the model of balance sheet first, advice second? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're all in the financial services business, money center banks and boutiques and, you know, one or two person kiosks. Um, it's like having all the doctors in the hospital where we are all trying to take care of patients, but we all do something a little bit different. And there's a place in the market for all of those types of firms. Um, I would say from independent boutique perspective, particularly those that have some more scale, uh, of which we are one, you're seeing a real adoption of having an independent advisor in the room, particularly for larger, more complex transactions. So of the top 20 transactions so far in 2024, uh, you have a, a, 11 transactions, and actually I think it's 14. I think I'm misspeaking, but it's even better than I thought actually. So of the top 20, I think 14 have a uh, independent advisor as either exclusive or co-advisor. Wow. So the dialogue's changed a little bit where 25 years ago, if you were a CEO or a board member or someone in a position where you need, advi you know, need to hire an advisor and make that decision, right. you used to say, well, you're not gonna get fired if you hire X money center bank. Right. I think the conversation's changed a little now to where people are saying, hey, we're doing something really big, really complex, we don't do this often, we don't have the internal capabilities for it. We have these money center banking relationships. What, why don't we have also uh, an independent advisor help navigate and be our Sherpa through these really you know, treacherous uh, walks that we're gonna be on? And I think that trend's in place, and it's been going for a while, but we're really starting to see it now in those larger transactions. Yeah, it used to be a second opinion, smaller role, where that yeah. was called. It sounds like it's now been inverted a little bit. Yeah, look, we've, we played a, a small part in that. Uh, of the top 15 transactions uh, that were valued at over 10 billion, we've had uh, a role in three of them, and uh, two of them as the lead advisor and uh, exclusive advisor on, on two of those transactions. So, um, One last thing while I have you was um, the SPAC market. Yeah. Um, you were a sponsor as a firm. I believe you went public through a SPAC transaction. We did. Um, if you look at some of our audience on the family office side, they've entered the SPAC market. Is that a one and done situation? Is that a technology or a, a framework that you think will stay and be you know, part of the, the menu of choices that, that private companies will look to? Uh, we're not seeing that. Uh, we did see a lot of it. Yeah. We chose to go public via SPAC for many reasons, which at the time were compelling. Uh, to, to our firm, to our partnership and owners and stakeholders. Uh, if we were doing that today, I, I don't know that the conditions would be ripe for us to do exactly what we did in June of 21. We were very, very lucky. The timing was perfect. We had zero redemptions. We had a business model where one year after we went public, uh, we beat the revenue estimates that we put out uh, for uh, two years ahead. So you know, we achieved in 2021, 801 million, and in the original uh, disclosures that we made around the SPAC, I think we were expecting that in 2023. Um, so we, we were very fortunate, we had very strong business flow uh, after we uh, had gone public. Today that market is smaller, uh, m much, much more bespoke. I mean, you really have to, it's not quite a needle in the haystack, but it's pretty close. Yeah. It's pretty close that there'll be some situations that I think are hand and glove fit, yep. uh, but there's gonna be, most Most are gonna look to traditional IPO market, um, and some won't look to go public at all. I mean, they're getting, private companies that get to scale have uh, plenty of uh, capital, they have liquidity to provide their stakeholders, yep. and they tend to have increasing valua valuations through 
a series of fundraising. So it's not really clear what they would get from public markets. Yeah, the value proposition between private and public Look, is... Yeah. yeah, and at some point you're forced to go because yeah. you, you cross thresholds of ownership, et cetera, where you're forced to become public. Um, but you'll see many, many companies stay private for longer and maybe some stay private forever. Well, uh, dynamic times. Uh, sounds like your firm is very well positioned and you guys are uh, doing a lot of things right. So congratulations. Welcome to Milken. If Thank I you very much. Privilege Great. of saying that and uh, more to follow. Thanks Great. so much. Thank you.